yeah. um, badly. But it's hard to say whether that's the healthcare system that failed or the administration uh, that failed, because it's very hard to distinguish. Because the quality of the physicians is expected to be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so it is more like supply ch chains of supply and yeah. other things. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. That's the system. The, that, those parts of the system don't clearly don't work well. You yeah. see other countries that have done better at that. Um, yeah. Well, also other countries, I think, uh, were better prepared. Uh, Hi, Gregor. Hi. Along other lines. Nice. Uh, like better immunity system, partly due to more vaccination than in this country and maybe other things. Hey, oh. CJ. Hi, bon CJ. Appetit. CJ. Yeah. Yeah. I'm testing. I'm testing. I, think I think that everything, everything is OK. Is okay. We are we online, are online on, YouTube. on YouTube. Well, we can wait. Uh, we have a few more minutes because we still hope that maybe Mindy and Feldman will join at least. And then others, you will never know who will join and who will not. Yeah. Maybe just Marco. Hey. Morning. Hi, morning. Hi, morning. Hi. Yes, yes, we are online on Facebook as well. As well. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Is there summer in Arizona? Yeah. There's the summer indeed. Over a hundred every day? Yeah, pretty much. Until it gets to 110, 115, it's manageable. Mm -hmm. So, not too bad, not too bad. How about, what, how about what you are? About the uh, no, we are mild. We're okay. We are within reason. So, we're in the mid 70s every day, high, mid to high 70s, and low, like. I don't know, 60. So comfortable. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 84 in, in, uh, in Amherst, 84. 85. So that's pretty oh. hot for us. Yes. <laughs> pretty good. Sure, that, that's winter for you. <laughs> well, that's winter for Luis. You know, and our. Yes, our yes. For that's winter. Winter. That, that's the temperature about now. Oh, I know. And it's the beginning of winter. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's now 26 here. here. <laughs> but but people are telling that probably our winter, winter will be one will be very cool, very will be very, cool, will be very warm. Very warm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hello, Doctor Mindy and Doctor Anatol. Hi there. Hi Mindy. How are you doing? Hi, Hi Anatol. Good to see Good you too. Okay, so <clears throat> we can wait for another minute or so, and then we'll probably begin. It's hot in Montreal, 33 degrees. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm. It's good it's, and it's Celsius. It's amusing. It's, it's kind of chilly in Pennsylvania, although we are like a thousand kilometers uh, south. Or nearly a thousand. Yeah. Something uh, uh, about the jet stream, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> there is. So. Yeah. Or you're beating us, Mindy. It's about 30 degrees in Amherst. Yeah, I think, well, it's all on the uh, west coast here, or east coast, I mean. Uh, there's <clears throat> hot heat, heat warning, I guess. Uh, we're not too far from you, Richard. Yeah. <clears throat> about 20, 22, 21 here. <laughs> so, oh, civilized I'm temperature. Perfect. <laughs> I think we're all going to join Gregor. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, so let us begin first a couple of announcements. Please don't forget that on Tuesday we're going to have questions and answers session and uh, all participants are encouraged to send their questions to Luis. Uh, 
you can address your questions to specific speakers or you can address them to the whole crowd, whoever wants to answer. I'm not sure whether we will have all 12 uh, during the questions and answer session, but we hope that we will have at least a few. Hey, Monica. Um, okay. Hello. So, uh, all right. So um, uh, this is our last uh, official talk uh, in this edition, but it's been a really large and long edition of the Motor Control Summer School. So our twelfth talk, and it's going by going to be presented by Richard Van Emmerich. Uh, for Richard, this is his first motor control summer school to present it, and we are looking forward to learning about um, locomotion, uh, whole body sense, and I don't know what else you're going to talk about. Something exciting, I'm pretty sure. So I'm going to ask everybody except Richard to turn off your microphones, so to mute your microphones. And Richard, whenever you are ready, share your screen. All right. <clears throat> Can people see that? Yes. Everything seems to work well, so I'm muting <clears throat> myself as well. OK. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, and, and the summer school for inviting me. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to do this for the first time. I probably would have should have done this way, way earlier. So. It's nice to be able to do this at this point virtually. Uh, so as Mark said, the, the title of my uh, presentation, the focus is on locomotion, especially the role of the upper body uh, in locomotor control. Uh, this first image is something we're going to hope to see back at some point on campus. And I'm sure that's the case for many of you, um, uh, because obviously that is not the typical image of campuses anymore at this point, but this is our kind of head slide that we usually have. Um, oops, it's not progressing. Let me see. Let me stop this for just a sec. Okay, so this is, uh, can you see my next slide? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is the overview of my talk. Uh, it has four sections. In the first one, I will uh, give you a kind of historical and current perspective on our understanding of the role of the upper body in the control of locomotion. The second one will go more specifically into uh, research and coordination dynamics. That's a lot of our own work. The third, we'll look at the integration of these locomotor dynamics with manual task performance. How are uh, those two components integrated? And the last section is uh, something that we've been recently uh, working on. This is work that I've been doing with uh, Joe Hamill Biomechanics on integrating uh, biomechanical aspects of uh, related to shock attenuation with the control of head movements and what that means for, uh, for visual perception. Um, so <clears throat> most of the work on locomotion, so the majority would typically look at lower extremity uh, dynamics, kinematics, and kinetics. And obviously that's a very essential uh, key component of locomotion. Clinically, we often see a focus on stride parameters as you see in the top graph here. So both from an experimental modeling perspective, this certainly has gotten a lot of attention. But the, importance and the, uh, the role of the upper body certainly has been recognized a long time ago. Uh, for example, uh, through David Winter's work, uh, identifying uh, certainly the, last, the, the, the large mass of the upper body, its role in uh, dynamic stability, and also the fact that the upper body is uh, essential here in uh, navigating and perceiving in complex environments. And that's something I will uh, talk about in a little bit more detail in the latter part of my talk. So the first section is on a bit of a historical perspective on what we have done and understand about the role of the upper body in the control of locomotion. Um, and what I'll focus on both on healthy uh, as well as disabled locomotion. Uh, 
healthy locomotion, we'll look at, uh, and, and of course the consequences for that in terms of uh, pathological gait, the role of the pelvis, uh, the trunk and thorax, as well as the head, and especially also the role of the arms in, uh, in the control uh, of gait. And then the second component is how these are impacted in different disease states, and especially I'll focus on, uh, on Parkinson's disease uh, on this. So I'd like to start with a, what I think is just a, a very interesting quote from a wonderful paper uh, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society by yeah. Collins and Dumchess and uh, on the dynamic arm swing in human walking. Okay. And their very first sentence states this, it is curious that humans swing their arms as they walk because the arms play no obvious role in locomotion. And when I read that sentence at first, I thought this is gonna be a horrible paper. Uh, at least I think they're gonna argue against this, uh, show why it is uh, obviously playing no role. But of course I was wrong because they actually give very clear argument and, and identification how, uh, what the role of the arms is through a variety of different modeling as well as experimental analysis. I'll come back to that uh, a little later. A very uh, a topic that's been around <laughs> for quite some time in assessing the role of arm swing uh, during gait is the question of whether arm swing is active or passive. And uh, the ideas and certainly arguments for this have been going back and forth. Uh, the more, a more recent one uh, by Ponser et al made a very strong claim that arm swing is passive and basically uh, the shoulders and trunk uh, act as elastic linkages uh, to basically passively swing the arm. So that's a fairly extreme position. A uh, paper by Mainz et al argued that arm swing is primarily passive, but stabilized by active control. And a more recent one by Gaudian <coughs> used it, uh, used musculoskeletal modeling and open sim clearly identified that um, without muscle activity, uh, arm swing decreases in amplitude and coordination becomes more in phase. So certainly passive dynamics are important, but without the active contribution, we get um, decreased amplitude and in phase motion. And also I'll show you later, those would be severe challenges to gate stability uh, if that were to happen, uh, certainly at higher speeds. So. The argument I'm gonna make and show you some clear data is that even in steady state locomotion, the arms will play a critical role in uh, uh, reducing uh, an energy expenditure, uh, but also improving stability and uh, regulation of, uh, of momentum. So a little bit of an historical perspective, uh, arm swing has been traditionally claimed to reduce the vertical oscillation of the body. So early work by Murray and Hendricks. But recently, this, the study I referred to earlier uh, by Collins actually did not find that. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail. The findings, whether or not it actually uh, reduces or keeps the vertical oscillations the same, are typically in contrast with what we see in running, where the arm oscillation increases the uh, vertical oscillations, uh, excursions of the center of mass. Arm swing also increases or helps balance the angular momentum that's generated by lower extremity. Early evidence came already from Elfman in 39, and certainly recent evidence supports that. Um, arm swing is also proposed to help counter uh, uh, thorax rotation, so minimize thorax rotation that might play an important role for head stabilization, important for visual perception. And a lot of that work is recently from Kubo et al, but earlier suggested by Murray in 67. And again, I'll get back to that in more detail. Finally, studies that have focused on reduced arm swing certainly have identified the critical function of arm swing, uh, like Womberger's study in 2008. And clinically, we see this in, in Parkinson's disease. So here are some, some uh, <clears throat> historical kind of images, and I'll, I'll show these kind of throughout the talk on occasions. This is from early work of Murray et al, clearly showing that with increased gait speed, uh, we see both at the level of the elbow and the level of the shoulder increase excursion. So the arm uh, increases its amplitude of oscillation, both at the shoulder and the elbow when we uh, increase uh, gait speed. And this is a very early study by, by Murray et al. Um, 
arm speed clearly, or sorry, range of motion of the arm, so amplitude increases as a function of gait speed. And we see here, this is our own study by uh, my uh, former PhD student, Jen Baird. Um, so when the walking speed increases, we see an increase in the range of motion uh, at the shoulder. And this is observed both in young as well as healthy older individuals. And I'll come back to this uh, a little later uh, as well. But it shows that our range of motion very systematically increases uh, across gait speeds from very low gait speed uh, at 0.4 meters per second to pretty high gait speed close to the transition to running at 1.8 meters per second. What happens when we reduce or suppress arm swing, in this case unilaterally, and this is a study by Ford et al. in 2007. So what, uh, when there's no constraint, this is the black line. Uh, we see that, uh, as we've shown before, our arm amplitude typically increases with, with gait speed. But when we constrain one side, in this case the red line, uh, the other side, the contralateral side now in the green line increases in amplitude. So there's a compensation for that when there is absent arm swing. And this is something, again, we'll come back to later in, in terms of path, uh, gait pathologies. So I'll, what I'd like to do now is go back to what I was saying, the, the, the beautiful study by Collins et al. in 2009. What they did was a combination of um, modeling they used a passive dynamic walker on the left and experimental manipulations. The passive dynamic walker had curiously had the arm swinging from the hips, but I don't think that that really has a big impact on their data. Although of course, typically that's not what we do. Their experimental manipulations had four conditions, normal arm swing, bound where the arms are bound to the trunk, held where participants had to actively uh, just, just keep their hands to their sides and then what they call anti-normal where the arms were swinging uh, naturally so the normal arm swing is uh, what we see on the left so a normal arm swing uh, has contralaterals so the arm uh, moves in phase with the contralateral leg in anti-normal they would swing in phase with the ipsy lateral leg um, and they had a number of very important results based on these manipulations. You see them in the slide here. So first, they found no changes in vertical oscillation of the center of mass, which was contrary to the earlier suggestions by Murray and, and Hendricks. Um, second, they found minimal shoulder torques, only a few percent of lower extremity, again, showing there is very little active control needed. But certainly, there is active control. And more importantly here, they found an increase in, in metabolic energy expenditure and uh, magnitude about 12% when the arms were prevented from swinging uh, their normal uh, oscillations. And this is consistent with uh, work by Umberger in 2008, finding a roughly 10% decrease in energy expenditure. So even though arm swing certainly has been shown to <coughs> require uh, metabolic energy, Overall, it reduced energy expenditure compared to no arms. Interestingly, the largest change in energy expenditure came from the anti-normal condition, but that's to be okay. expected. So that uh, creates uh, no, for the the changes that are opposite the, the normal patterns. What they also found was that the absence of arm swing increases <coughs> what we call the peak mm, vertical trace. moment. So this is, or the other term for this is the free, uh, free moment. So the peak vertical moment uh, around the foot center of pressure, so the foot ground interface. Again, this is consistent with work by Umberger. And what this does is certainly uh, increase in this free ah, moment, would transmit forces uh, upward through Ta the bon. leg, the moments to leg and pelvis. This has to be resisted no. by internal and no. external rotational moments. And this requires uh, increased metabolic energy expenditure. John, John. So clearly, um, the absence of arm swing, uh, this is one of the mechanisms by, through which this would require additional expenditure uh, of energy. We have an image of that free moment. Um, this is also being investigated quite extensively in running. So my colleague, Joe Hamill, 
uh, have just investigated this, this moment in terms of uh, lower extremity injuries and, and the potential link to uh, stress fractures. <clears throat> so here is another classic image. This now goes all the way back to 1939. This is work from Elfman showing nicely the, uh, the role of the arms in terms of the regulation of whole body angular momentum. So I want to focus your attention to the top graph. So and on top we have uh, the momentum around the z-axis, around the vertical. So we're nicely showing that the arms counter that of the rest of the body. In this example, almost keeping that angular whole body angular momentum close to zero. Well, that doesn't always happen. Um, but definitely the focus here is that the arms, the role of the arms is in trying to encountering <coughs> the angular momentum generated by the legs, uh, therefore reducing uh, whole body angular momentum. And <coughs> that's shown again here in this graph from the Collins study. So in addition to the uh, free moment, we'll see uh, an increase in that whole body angular momentum when we uh, when we eliminate <coughs> arm swing, and again, this is comparison is here between normal and the arms either bound or or held, uh, both increasing angular momentum compared to um, normal gait. We find something similar in our own studies. Uh, in this case, now across a range of gait speeds so on the horizontal axis, we have speed again going from very low slow speed to close to the transition. And on the vertical, we have angular momentum around the vertical axis. And what we see is that uh, when we uh, prevent the arms from swinging, which is the dashed line right here, we see an increase in that whole body angular momentum. Uh, interestingly, we don't find that when we uh, actually have people walk with a brace that prevents relative motion between thoracic and pelvic rotations. Uh, <clears throat> kind of suggesting that those rotations uh, create, uh, have less of a contribution uh, to angular momentum uh, of the whole body. And we'll get back to that in a few slides. And this is work, more recent work from Brown et al. in 2013, uh, showing indeed that the arms have a much greater contribution to angular momentum. As you see here, about 20 to 30% compared to the thorax and the pelvis. The scales are different, but you can see here that those contributions, even across a variety of speeds, are at most about four to five percent from the thorax and even less uh, from the pelvis, <coughs> so two percent or less. And that's the same across a range of gait speeds. All right, what about arm function and gait stability? Uh, I can't review the entire literature on that, so what you'll see is a little bit of a snapshot and taste of the different types of uh, manipulations that people have done. <clears> On <throat> top here, we have work from Ortega. They used a lateral stabilizer and showed that using that reduces the metabolic cost of walking in both young and older individuals. And interestingly, that reduction was larger increased uh, when they had no arm swing. And their interpretation was that arm swings, which is of course an indirect assessment, but, but reasonable, that arm swing certainly plays a role in at least the regulation of lateral gait stability. Um, some research from Brian et al. in the Netherlands uh, looked at steady state locomotion first. They used <coughs> nonlinear dynamical analyses uh, using Lyapunov analysis. And what they found was that the absence of or the, whether or not people use their arms had fairly little effect on that uh, local dynamic stability. So under steady state condition, people were um, not impacted in terms of local dynamic stability by the uh, presence or absence of arm swing. This local dynamic stability measures, assesses kind of just minute perturbations to gait, so no obvious mechanical ones, <clears throat> but the kind of steady state, step-to-step -step kind of perturbations that you typically would encounter. Interestingly, when they did perturbations, and as you can see that in the bottom graph, uh, they actually did find that the absence of arm swing <clears throat> led to what we call a longer relaxation time to the attractor, the white bars here, 
or no arm swing compared to the dark bars <clears throat> and the relaxation time. So the time it took to return to steady state uh, is in, was increased uh, in, the, in the absence uh, of arm swing. And again, this happened at a variety of, of gait speeds from, from slower to uh, faster. would be hard pressed not to mention some of Mindy's work, at least from Mindy's lab, uh, from Todd Groskoffi, who did also these kind of perturbation studies. And one of their findings uh, was that um, when we compare young and older individuals, um, the difference is more in phase shifts. So older adults have um, larger phase shifts in the lower extremity uh, compared to the upper extremities. In this case, arms play a very critical role in maintaining stability and in older adults that uh, is not uh, impacted, at least older healthy adults. So back to some of our own work, um, as we indicated, when we increase speed, arm amplitude increases. So that's our own research has shown that and this should took plates in 2015. Although over, and these are both treadmill studies, <clears throat> over ground, Merrillman et al. didn't show that. Um, they, show redu they show reduced arm swing as a function of aging when walking over ground. However, one of the issues in that study was that they didn't control for gait speed. And as we can see here, or at least they didn't control directly. <clears throat> as we can see from this slide, gait speed is certainly uh, an important uh, component in the uh, amplitude of arm swing. What we also found was that when we compare old and young individuals, the ability of the arms to uh, counter the angular momentum by the legs is, is similar in, in older and younger individuals. There are some differences at slower speeds. That's because the older adults have uh, overall smaller whole body angular momentum. So but overall, that contribution of the arms uh, remains fairly similar in healthy older adults. Uh, walking at different gait speeds. What about reduced arm swing and uh, impact on uh, disease? As we showed before, so the Collins studies and the Umberger studies clearly showed the effects of reduced arm swing on metabolic energy expenditure, on angular momentum regulation, and as we've seen in the previous slides on gait stability. Um, and I can't review the entire literature on Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of work done on <clears throat> trying to improve gait in people with Parkinson's disease through visual cues. Um, and that certainly has been proven to be very helpful. But an interesting, more recent study from John Jacob's lab um, tried to directly impact arm <clears throat> oscillations. And as we know, Parkinson's disease has lots of aspects that are impact gait, there's a shuffling gait, so short steps, but there's also absence of arm swing, Oops. absence of arm swing, there's actual rigidity that I'll come back to a little later, and there's two uh, posture. So what uh, Jacob's team was interested in is, to, is seeing whether or not increasing arm swing could actually improve some of these um, uh, gait characteristics in people with Parkinson's disease. So they used, um, vibratory feedback devices uh, that would alert people uh, when arm swing would not be reaching a particular set uh, amplitude. And interestingly, they found that these cues, what they call the arm sense cues, as you see on the right side of the slide, compared to baseline, improved step length and also uh, lower the cadence. So overall, they improved the gait patterns uh, compared to baseline walking, and that was maintained in the retention test. The effects were slightly less than what they saw with visual cues, but certainly from our perspective, interesting that certainly arm swing directly can uh, improve uh, gait characteristics in, in Parkinsonian uh, locomotion, Parkinsonian gait. Another important topic, of course, in arm swing is related to arm swing asymmetry. And again, I can't review this entire literature in uh, Parkinson's disease. Again, there is a very strong asymmetry compared to controls. That asymmetry can be due to asymmetrical rigidity, certainly tremors. So you see an example of 
the, the service area here in comparing left arm versus right arm angular acceleration is much, much greater than in the controls indicating a symmetry that you can also see here. So the symmetry index in the Parkinson disease patients is much greater than we see in controls. However, it doesn't mean that in healthy gait, we don't see asymmetries. And there's some interesting observations, the latest by Colleen et al, that tend to indicate that even in healthy controls, we see an asymmetry that tends to favor the left arm, where we see greater arm swing on the left. And exactly why that is, is obviously still a big question. Uh, it could be because maybe, and we'll get to that later, People use the right arm for other activities. The left arm is maybe more involved in stabilizing the body. But interestingly, Kalina et al. found that that asymmetry is actually the same in left-handers as well. So that's kind of still pretty a bit of an open issue, but clearly the message here is that asymmetries are not just observed in, in Parkinson's disease or other conditions. I wanna give you a few bits of information related arm swing uh, uh, or the, about the function of the arm swing and running. Although this is not a review about running, so there's obviously much more going on than what I can talk about. First, uh, as shown by a study by uh, Hamner et al. in 2010, that they have very little contribution to propulsion or support. Arms in running only provide about 1% of the center of mass acceleration, peak acceleration. But very importantly, the arms actually much more than walking effectively counterbalance the, the vertical angular momentum uh, and generate, especially those generated by the, by the lower extremities. Running with arms significantly increases metabolic cost. Some of the Cram's lab study shows about a 10% increase and certainly related to increased rotational amplitudes of shoulder and pelvis. Uh, that are then needed to really counter the angular momentum generated by the swinging legs. Also, it's been shown, again from Kran's lab, that um, reduction or, or running without arms significantly increases the lateral step width variability. Uh, and again, they found that it uh, minimizes, uh, the presence of arm swing minimizes metabolic cost, so the absence would increase that. So the next slide shows the first point. So here you kind of nicely see that in running, this is from the Hamner study, the arms, the dashed lines, uh, very nicely counter um, the angular momentum generated by the swinging legs and running. Okay, so switching from the arms now to the pelvis. Um, these are images from what we always call a classic study by Saunders, Inman, and Eberhard in 1953 on determinants of gait. And of the six determinants, they identify two related to the pelvis that we see here. <clears throat> and the pelvis, both pelvis rotation in the transverse plane and uh, uh, pelvic tilt and frontal plane were seen as very important components in controlling the oscillations of the center of mass, especially the vertical oscillation. So for a long time, <clears throat> based on Saunders' work, uh, these rotations were considered to be effective or certainly playing a role in, in minimizing center of mass oscillations and therefore potentially center of the, uh, metabolic energy expenditure in the body. However, an important recent work, especially uh, Kuo's work in 2006, uh, strongly argued against that, um, just the idea that these, these determinants, especially the pelvic ones, is here. So this will be the implication that there's very little oscillation, vertical oscillation of the center of mass. But certainly based on current insights and the fact that uh, ideas of walking as um, <clears throat> being identified by the pendular dynamics, inverted pendulum dynamics in terms of stance phase and swinging pendula during the um, uh, swing phase, um, Kuo's work in 2006 clearly showed both, again, based on experimental and modeling data, that if we had a flat center of mass trajectory or something close to that, actually significantly increases uh, metabolic energy expenditure. And this certainly has been shown in some other studies. So the alternative clearly is the inverted pendulum model where energy certainly in terms of swing uh, is 
close or maybe uh, very free and the mechanical work is related to the step to step transition <coughs> from <coughs> sorry <coughs> from step to step however even some of our early work that Sandy Whittlesey did in our lab in labs in uh, in 2000 showed that the swing phase is actually not entirely passive uh, his analysis nicely showed that even in the swing phase about 30% of that is only passive and the rest is still certainly under the influence of active control mechanisms. But the overall message here is that as uh, initially identified by Saunders work, the, the uh, flattening of the center of mass is not necessarily a way to, uh, uh, to preserve or to increase ener or decrease energetic uh, energy expenditure, metabolic energy expenditure. So what happens with the pelvis <clears throat> when we increase gait speed? And there's a lot of data here. <clears throat> and I wanna focus your attention on the right, because in this study, this is a study we did in 2005 in my lab, we looked at uh, the uh, changes in all three planes, so lateral flexion, so pelvis obliquity, flexion extension, so tilt and actual rotation. And this is a study that looked really at the age-related changes in those movements. So at a young group, middle group, middle-aged group and older group. And the one I want you to pay attention to here is, um, well, first overall, you can see that on this, the middle-aged group is kind of nicely, indeed in the middle of young and old. So they truly are uh, middle-aged as we would call it. Uh, but all three age groups, um, and you can see that here on the right, uh, as a function of gait speed, again, we start with a very, where my arrow is, a very slow gait speed of 0.2, which is almost kind of standing and then moving the leg very slowly. We first see a decrease in pelvis rotation up to about 0.8, 1.0 meters per second. And then we see a very significant increase after that in uh, pelvic rotation. That increase <clears throat> around one uh, meters per second is traditionally uh, called the pelvic step. <clears throat> and the original idea that's been around for a long time is that this pelvic step would be a major contributor to in, or us increasing step length uh, during walking, as of course is happening when we increase speed. But some more recent work by Leong et al. and, and Brian in uh, 14 and 2008 has very nicely shown that this contribution is actually very limited. Uh, so what, they, what you see here is a, as a function of gait speed, we see the contribution of that pelvic step or the pelvis rotation to stride length or step length. And what, if we focus just on normal stepping, the black bars, it's at low speeds <clears throat> is actually negative, meaning that the pelvis move kind of counter to, to hip uh, rotation. And only at higher speeds, they start to move in the same direction and contributes to increasing step length, but very, very little. At most here, about 2%. So <clears throat> this pelvic, this increase of pelvis rotation is more a, a general function of gait uh, based on this work and not necessarily a key contributor uh, to increasing the step length, but it probably is necessary uh, to do that. Um, <clears throat> what about the trunk if we move up? <clears throat> and <clears throat> In the slides that come, uh, we often talk about trunk or thorax or the lumbar segment. So the trunk overall, uh, we define it as the thoracic and, and lumbar components. Um, and, and research kind of uses the term very often differently. So what we see here is um, an analysis of trunk flexion. So probably reflecting both the thoracic and lumbar regions. <clears throat> this is work by Grebner et al. Contribute a lot of research to this. Uh, showing very nicely that when we do perturbations and look at the trunk flexion angle <clears throat> at the recovery foot contact, that that trunk flexion angle steadily increases from young controls to older adults to those older adults who fall. And um, so the, the, this means that, the, that when we get older, the control of that trunk becomes harder. Uh, but certainly you can discriminate potentially between those uh, older adults who have a tendency of falls or from a history of falls and those who, who don't. Um, in addition, what's uh, important is that the actual rotation of the trunk uh, has some systematic changes as a function of gait speed. And again, this is work we did in 2005 and you'll see in the next slide. 
Um, again, this is a lot of data. I want you to focus primarily on the changes in the uh, actual rotation, the transverse plane. And what we overall see is that from very slow speeds to higher gate speeds, we see a reduction in that actual rotation. So we kind of tend to stabilize the trunk when we start walking at higher gate speeds. And uh, in a little bit, I'll, I'll relate that back to the function of arm swing. But what's interesting here is that um, that reduction is seen in all three age groups, but less so in the younger, or at least they stay more or less constant. This is the blue line, although they eventually do decrease. But interestingly, both the middle and older age individuals first significantly increase uh, the rotation of the trunk before they decrease that again. So even though at the end at higher gate speeds, <clears throat> they, they show similar or even just slightly improved reductions in rotation um, at uh, gate speeds up to about 1.0 meters per second, that rotation is actually increased. What that means for stability is unsure or for the regulation of stability, uh, but what it could indicate is that even lower gate speed or slower gate speed could be challenging to some older individuals. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Richard? Yep. Yeah. It's the other Richard. Um, before you go on to the next section, um, you've done a wonderful job of laying out some of the history of, this, of these topics. Uh, there's one other um, issue I was wondering if uh, it's worth bringing up at this point. Um, and that is that in quadrupeds, you know, there's a very tight coordination between the upper extremities and, and our four, four limbs and hind limbs in the case of quadrupeds. And Paul Zer has done some really uh, excellent work uh, in the last decade or so, uh, looking at um, the influence of upper extremity motion on lower extremity coordination. And it's even been um, proposed that uh, recovery from spinal cord injury can be potentiated by engaging the upper extremities. So I'm wondering in terms of you know, underlying mechanisms to promote energy conservation, et cetera, if um, this, uh, these neurophysiological indications could be uh, a mechanism underlying the, the influence of um, um, upper extremity motion on lower extremity motion. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, uh, Richard. So what, um, in fact, in the third, uh, where my arrow is now, in the third section, I, I'll get into that a little bit more, oh, <clears throat> not, um, not in great detail, but I'll actually talk a little bit about, say, uh, Dietz's work and the idea of uh, the natural kind of integration between locomotor, uh, in terms of upper and lower extremities in locomotor dynamics, and how that might be tough to break, say, when we do activities they're not, not just uh, walking, uh, but say in, involve uh, picking up objects. So we actually get uh, kind of more skillful movements related to the arms that now need to be integrated with locomotor control. So hopefully that, <clears throat> that gets a little bit to it, although maybe probably not quite where you wanted to go, but that, that so okay. some of that is to come. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, we'll, um, move on to the next section. So in this section, I want to talk a little bit more about coordination dynamics. So how, how are some of these components, arms, certainly arms, legs, pelvis, thorax, how are they coordinated and integrated uh, in both healthy and, and pathological gait? Um, oops. Looks like something advanced doesn't work. Uh, let me stop it for just a sec. Okay, can you see the next slide? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, so this next section is on coordination dynamics, and, and before I go into the work, a lot of this work I started in the early 90s with my uh, dear friend and colleague Robert Wagenaar, uh, who uh, unfortunately uh, passed away in 2013, and I want to 
acknowledge Robert in this work as being an essential component. And uh, Robert was a very talented researcher contributing a tremendous amount of work to uh, rehabilitation sciences, uh, especially in, in the area of stroke, uh, but also in Parkinson's disease. And that's something we, we worked on together uh, since, since the, the, so the mid uh, 90s um, in terms of coordination dynamics. So a lot of this work was inspired by <coughs> uh, uh, concepts and, and the uh, uh, paradigm of nonlinear non dynamics and dynamical systems, uh, certainly advanced by uh, Haken and Kelso and also Gregor Schoener, who talked about some of this earlier in the summer school. So the, 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 uh, without going into the details, of course, the key element of this is that um, through the concepts of the control and order parameter uh, that we can try to establish uh, <clears throat> patterns, and in our case, gate patterns, uh, there in terms of their persistence and change. So under what types of manipulations do patterns uh, remain persistent or remain constant? And, and when do they change? Uh, as we can see here in the paradigm of say the, <clears throat> the finger transition experiments. Uh, key concepts would be fluctuations. So the role variability in that persistence and change. But another one is the concept of hysteresis. The fact that when we control, when we manipulate a control parameter, in this case, gate speed, uh, we can observe different gate patterns dependent on the direction of that change. And of course, this is what in a perspective called uh, hysteresis. So for example, when we <clears throat> start walking, we increase gait speed, we transition at a certain speed, but when we decrease speed, then that transition occurs typically at a slower speed. So this is what we call the hysteresis region, meaning <clears throat> we can observe different coordination patterns or different pattern, depending on how we were changing uh, that control parameter. And that <clears throat> concept certainly uh, was very instrumental in a lot of our early experiments that I <clears throat> did with Robert. I'll show you one example of that here, where we looked at Parkinsonian tremor. And there's a lot of data here, but what we see here is the frequency spectra of the arms and legs at different speeds. This is at a very low speed, uh, 0.2 meters per second. And this patient is showing a very clear tremor in the arm, as we see here. Parkinsonian tremor is typically in the area of 46 hertz. And with an increased speed, we see a disappearance or certainly a very small amount of tremor left. <clears throat> and certainly the tremor is nowhere close to the movement frequency. But when we decrease speed then again, we see that that is, is, is maintained. So there's not a reoccurrence of that tremor. So I think a nice early example <clears throat> of the uh, effect of control parameter change in this case on um, the, the presence or absence of um, of, the, of the, the Parkinsonian tremor, in, in this case, in the, uh, in the left arm. <clears throat> we also did some studies uh, looking at the relationship between the arms and the legs, and we used compound modeling, pendulum modeling, based on the work of Kugler and Turvey and Hold et al. And what we showed was that um, below speeds of about 0.75 meters per second, and this, this is coming back as kind of a critical speed in walking, as we've shown before, that around that speed, <clears throat> certainly significant changes seem to occur, especially, say, with the pelvic rotation. Uh, so below 0.75, um, the preferred movement frequencies of the arm could be predicted by the resonant frequencies of the arm. But above 0.75, the preferred frequencies of the arm would, uh, can be predicted by the resonance frequency of the leg. And this is associated with the transition that you can see here. So if we look at gait speed, walking velocity, again, go from low, goes from low to high. <clears throat> we see that um, the spectral power of the arm frequencies at first is dominated by the stepping frequency, so the, fre the, the frequency of the arms. And in this case, the, oscillate, the, the relationship between the arms and legs is a two to one. So we have a predominant two to one frequency relationship. When speed then increases, that two to one sl uh, starts to decrease and the one to one component starts to increase. And again, that's shift over, that's shift between those two dominant frequency components in the relationship occurs around 0 0.75, 0 0.8 meters per second. Okay? So the intrinsic door <coughs> coordination dynamics of the arms and legs <coughs> changes from a one to two 
at slow speeds to a one-to-one -one at faster speeds. What we also see as a function of speed is a change in the coordination between the pelvis and the thorax. And again, there's a lot of data here, again, from our experiment in 2005. I want you to focus primarily on the transverse plane. <clears throat> what we see here is again gate speed from low to high. And also on this axis, on the vertical axis, <clears throat> is the continuous relative phase. So this is a measure of the coordination between the pelvis and thorax. Low values close to zero means they're in phase. <clears throat> high values close to 180 means they're anti phase. So, as a function of gate speed, we see a, a kind of a gradual change <clears throat> sorry, from, uh, from in phase to anti phase motion. And again, this happens in all three age groups, although a little less so at higher speeds in the older adults. So, the older adults have. Um, less of a change to an anti-phase motion compared to middle uh, and younger adults. Interestingly, if I look at other planes, I'm gonna not focus on this, but like the frontal plane, uh, it seems like the middle-aged individuals uh, are not quite sure who they are. <laughs> at low speeds, they seem to be closer to older individuals, but then at higher speeds, as we see here, they feel themselves more like young individuals. This is maybe why we at middle age, at least we hope we still are, uh, tend to go fast. But anyway, this is an interesting kind of change in, in the behavior of middle age in the frontal plane. But again, we're not gonna focus on that. The key focus is here. It's that actual rotation, actual coordination between the pelvis and the thorax in the transverse plane, uh, clearly showing a change from uh, in phase to more anti-phase motion. And again, that's preserved to a large degree in older individuals, although a little less so. Now, traditionally, this anti-phase motion, certainly at higher gate speeds, was proposed to counter um, or reduce the angular momentum of the body. And these, these suggestions have been made very early by Murray and Notra. We've been guilty, or we've made these claims in the past, but some of the more recent work clearly shows that this is not the case. Uh, first of all, due to the small rotations of the thorax, but as I showed earlier, Brian's work showing clearly that thoracic rotation, thoracic motion has an overall very small contribution, not more than a few percent to uh, uh, body, uh, uh, whole body angular momentum. Okay? So that counter rotation is not necessarily uh, induced to reduce angular momentum of the body, but it's still important uh, as I'll show later because it helps the increased arm swing, at least that's one of the propositions. And this is work that uh, Robert has done uh, at Boston University with uh, Ken Holt, Elliot Saltzman, and uh, uh, Mayashi uh, um, Kubo, um, showing very clearly that increased arm swing helps uh, reduce that thoracic movement, so actually is a key component in helping reduce thoracic rotations. And they um, argue through their modeling that this regulates the parent actual trunk stiffness. And as a consequence, uh, that might help uh, control head stability. And this is an element that I will address in more detail in the last part of my talk. And this has been kind of confirmed by some more recent work using forward dynamic modeling by Prince et al, showing that clearly the arms play a very important role in regulating this apparent trunk stiffness, much more so than the uh, counter motions of the thorax and pelvis. But again, the two are related. That counter motion is gonna be important in regulating or reducing uh, increased arm swing. So back to thoracic uh, pelvis coordination. As I showed earlier, we see an increase from in-phase to anti-phase in controls and even all healthy older adults show that pattern. So we see here is one of our early studies using gate speed as a control parameter on the horizontal axis. So go from low speed up to high gate, higher gate speeds, and then reduce gate speed again. And for controls, we see the nice um, inverted U shape. So go from in phase to close to anti phase and then back to in phase. This is an example of a, an advanced person with Parkinson's disease where you see that that change in relative phase is not really occurring. Although interestingly, uh, the control parameter manipulation induces a little of that. When we increase speed here, things 
purely stay in phase, but when we start to decrease it, we see some tendency towards a little bit more anti or out of phase motion before returning to in phase. And again, showing the importance potentially of changing these, this control parameter uh, gate speed in different ways, both increasing and decreasing uh, that, that gate speed. Interestingly, we also see a, a, a significant reduction in the variability of the relative phase. And with variability, we mean how does that relative phase change from gate cycle to gate cycle? So the variability here is a function of the cycle to cycle vari uh, variations. And what we see is that the variability is consistently lower in the patient with Parkinson's disease, again at the bottom, the till uh, graph here, compared to controls. Now that's the case in more advanced case of Parkinson's disease, but some of our early studies show that this is actually also the case in those who are recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And this was a 99 study that we did showing uh, very clearly also a reduction in the uh, degree of counter rotation that we see as a function of gait speed in Parkinson's disease compared to controls, <clears throat> a reduction in the variability of that relative phase compared to controls. But interestingly, we saw no changes in the stride duration variability that's certainly been used a lot as a variable to identify clinical gait changes. So this work um, shows nicely that even in recently diagnosed patients with Parkinson's disease, we have actual rigidity, so a decreased ability to counter uh, rotate uh, trunk and pelvis, thorax and pelvis, decreased variability, and no changes in stride duration variability. And that's an important component because in most the gait studies, of course, the focus is on <clears throat> increased variability, either in aging or disease. And that certainly happens in a lot of cases. But what this shows is that doesn't always have to be the case. And we see a change in variability in the coordination dynamics, but not in uh, the stride, uh, stride parameters, as this, this research nicely showed. Um, this raises questions about variability, of course, and, and where to observe that in the system, already uh, uh, identified years and years ago by Bernstein. It's a key concept, of course, in, in the in control manifold concept that uh, Marcus talked extensively about, developed by uh, John Schultz and Gregor Scherner, and, and certainly <clears throat> uh, contributed a lot to by uh, Mark's <clears throat> lab and research. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that later when we <clears throat> look at that in the context of, say, uh, the integration between task dynamics and, uh, and variability at the coordination level in terms of uh, the last section that I'll discuss. <clears throat> Before we move on to the next section, I want to conclude this section on coordination dynamics <clears throat> with some work that we've been doing for quite some time on uh, time to contact. And uh, to give you a bit of the history, this is work that um, was, was originally developed by my good friend and colleague, Gary Riccio, and further expanded by uh, Carl Newell and, and, and Sam Slobanoff at Penn State and, and our own research team as well. So the time to contact was initially done a lot on postural control where the argument is that center of pressure, center of mass dynamics should be evaluated in the context of their proximity or distance to the base of support. There's an essential component also in Hoff's <clears throat> model uh, and analysis of dynamic stability. That's when become very popular these days in the literature, using the extrapolated center of mass based on inverted pendulum dynamics to assess um, the, uh, the, the center of mass dynamics in relation to that base of support. We've done a lot of work on this in terms of static postural control, also in looking at postural perturbations, uh, where in one paradigm we would increase, use perturbation actually as a control parameter, just like the gate speed examples. And in this, in this particular paradigm, we would instruct people to maintain a bipedal base of support, as you see here, uh, as long as they could, and only step when they felt absolutely necessary to step. So when they perceived an imminent threat to stability, uh, they would be allowed to step. So we actually were investigating time to contact here as some sort of an informational variable, just like uh, David Lee's work in visual perception on which this is, is strongly based. 
And um, so what we did is uh, perturb the body with a pendulum. At zero is the impact, and we would look at the dynamics of the center of mass, in this case, in relation to the uh, anterior boundary <coughs> of the base of support, so at the toes, and analyze the <coughs> center of mass time to contact, and especially when that time to contact would reach a minimum value, as you see here, as, uh, as key information uh, in terms of making decisions to, in this case, change uh, the base of support, whether or not to do that. And we showed that at the time of contact is a nice predictor of when people step. And interestingly, and this is work uh, I did with uh, my colleague Ryan Coltwell and our former grad student CJ Hessen, who's now at Northeastern University, um, that actually using time to contact uh, resulted in better predictions than Hobbes' model of the um, extrapolated center of mass. But all of the models predicted it fairly well <coughs> in terms of the uh, time to contact thresholds. Now, this is a little bit of the background on this. What, why I'm introducing it here again is we use this concept to look at the coordination dynamics of the swing foot and the center of mass in the approach to this interior uh, stability boundary, to the anterior boundary of the base of support. <clears throat> and this is based on David Lee's work on time to contact coupling between say, two components. In this case, we looked at the center of mass, swing foot, and how these two movements are coupled in relation to uh, <clears throat> the, the anterior boundary <clears throat> of the base of support, as well as the establishment of the next uh, foot contact, next landing area. <clears throat> and here, uh, <clears throat> this work, by the way, is an uh, important contribu contribution to this work was by my former uh, grad student, uh, Jeb Romelius. And what you see here is, um, so in the image here, you see the approach of the center of mass and the swing foot to the anterior boundary, so the anterior part of the base of support. <clears throat> and the time to contact here expresses that approach. And here's uh, the gait cycle. So 0% is a toe off to uh, the next heel contact. What we see is that initially the time to contact of the swing foot is longer then the center of mass, then it overtakes the center of mass, and eventually, of course, uh, arrives earlier at the next uh, foot contact. For us, this, 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 co this crossing here and the coupling is a critical value, a critical variable, because <clears throat> in contrast to analysis previously done that focused primarily on the movement of the center of mass <clears throat> in relation to the base of support <clears throat> and establishing stability that way, in our view, the key element is the, um, the coupling, the coordination of that center of mass to the swing foot, because that establishes the next foothold. Uh, in the past, we've, we've used terms like the, uh, Winter did <clears throat> in terms of controlled fall, uh, relating the center of mass dynamics to the base of support and either exceeding that or not. Um, but Anatole has certainly uh, critiqued that in uh, various ways, in latest in 2015, <clears throat> that um, we probably should see locomotion in this sense as um, a series, based on reference control, we should see locomotion as a series of progressive shifts in equilibrium positions and not a series of kind of falls and trying to catch that. And uh, although we've used controlled fall in the past, I fully agree with that because as this analysis showed, there's an ongoing coordination here between the swing foot and the center of mass that's critical in, in, in uh, controlling continuous gait and, 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 and uh, certainly uh, preserving the, um, the maintenance and the stability of that. So <clears throat> I agree with Anatole's assessment here <clears throat> that this is uh, not a series of controlled falls, but it's really a series of progressive shifts identified in this case by the ongoing coordination dynamics between the swing foot and the center of mass. <clears throat> and that some of that coordination can be impacted in disease is shown by a work on multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is an area that we've been working on in the last 10 years quite extensively. As probably most know, MS is, is a disease, autoimmune disease, impacts many aspects, certainly gait, both the, the, the motor control, so the, the motor aspects as well as sensory aspects are, are, are impacted. And one of the uh, consistent findings which you see on the left is that people with MS at a variety of gait speeds 
use increase their, their durable support time compared to controls increase. And of course, this is a functional adaptation related to, to certainly gait instabilities uh, and typically seen as a good ad a functional adaptation to, to those uh, <clears throat> gait impairments. But what's interesting is that what our research also showed is that these, when we use this time to contact coupling, that as a result, <clears throat> the MS um, participants or people with MS developed a reduced margin of the center of mass crossing compared to the swing foot. Um, and in a way that the swing foot, uh, swing face might be offering some challenges to people with MS. And uh, this happens at a variety of gait speeds, actually from slow to fast. But interestingly, it doesn't happen <clears throat> when we ask people to walk at their preferred speeds. So what that means is that preferred locomotion for people with MS is truly preferred <clears throat> in the sense that it probably is a more stable pattern. But once they have, again, imposed gait speeds that could also be uh, slower, <clears throat> we see kind of a detriment in that coupling that certainly could uh, impact the swing phase dynamics. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so that was the first two sections. Uh, how are we doing? Do we need to take a small break or I'm okay to go on? Mark? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, let's go on then. Um, so this is the third section. So what I want to do now is um, show you some work that we've recently been doing <clears throat> on integrating these locomotor dynamics with manual task performance. And I think um, we'll, we'll get back to some of the questions, hopefully, that, that Richard asked earlier. So in this work, what we're interested in is how um, <clears throat> locomotor dynamics are integrated both with uh, manual, ta uh, with object transport, as we see on top, but also with uh, manual uh, uh, prehension and grasping movements. And a lot of this is going on in this area. So this is actually a recent image from Boston Dynamics, that quadrupedal robot <coughs> opening doors. And it's actually quite something to watch this. I'm not gonna show you the, the video. I think you can see this for yourself if you haven't seen it. It is quite interesting and maybe a little eerie, but how, how well controlled uh, this, this, this robot can actually do that. But there's no coincidence that they do this with a quadruped. Uh, this will be a heck of a lot more difficult to, um, to develop this with, with, bipedal, uh, with a bipedal robot. Okay? So I'm not gonna get into this for now, but what I'm gonna show you some of the work we've been doing on the integration between the locomotor dynamics and uh, uh, both object transport as well as uh, prehension and grasping. So before we do that, <clears throat> some of the, um, uh, as I promised earlier, a uh, bit of a review of what we know about the neural integration, neural coupling between um, arm and leg movements and, and, and how this is proposed to be different uh, when we say are involved in, as you can see in A, in, in skilled hand movements versus B, uh, when we are locomoting, and this is a lot based on work by, by Dietz, but certainly others as well. Um, so the idea is that when we are involved in skill and movements and hand performance, there's a strong direct motor neural uh, excitation that's, predom that's predominant. Um, and basically we get some inhibition of the uh, uh, cervical and proprio-spinal uh, neuronal networks. But when we locomote, <clears throat> um, we, the assumption is that the brain um, uh, commands are predominantly mo um, mediated by interneurons <clears throat> and that there's a very strong coupling between the cervical and the uh, thoracolumbar uh, segments <clears throat> through the different spinal pattern generator networks. And without going into all the evidence, uh, a few examples, for example, work uh, on <clears throat> uh, electrical mechanical stimulation shows clear that when we apply these stimulations to the leg, uh, we see distinct <clears throat> bilateral arm muscle EMG responses <clears throat> that are only evoked during walking. 
So when we do that during sitting or even standing, we don't tend to see these. Um, so what this shows is that um, the pathways that couple the upper and lower extremities uh, uh, appear to be gated by CPGs during walking, uh, and they can possibly or possibly regulated by supraspinally through the supplementary motor area. What it means though is that um, if we now try to integrate these two components, so we are trying to walk and we're trying to do something like this, uh, we might have a totally different uh, picture or situations. Here now we might have to decouple these intrinsically coupled networks that are present during locomotion and that naturally guide the interactions between the arms and the legs. And now when we're involved in this, as well as something like this, we might have to decouple that or certainly integrate these two uh, much more clearly. And um, the work I'm gonna show you uh, is, is descriptive in the sense that it's, it's showing how people manage to do this and what changes we might see <coughs> Sorry, with aging. Uh, but of course, we, we eventually need to inter integrate this <coughs> with assessments of the underlying neural components of that. <clears throat> the first work I want to talk to you a little bit more about is uh, research that my former grad student, Lino Amato, did in my uh, lab. And Lino did a wonderful study on, on uh, object transport, uh, and his dissertation was on walking for object transport. And what Lino used was a conceptual task that certainly is analogous to trying to carry a cup of your favorite drink, and we'll do this after this talk. Um, his conceptual task was holding a cup <coughs> with a ball on top. <coughs> Sorry, and, the, and the, the, the task here was to try to keep that ball within, and it's almost like a, a, a precision aiming task, keep that ball within a, an area, in this case within the red circle. Um, and Lino did this under different types of task constraints. So first question that he was interested in was how does this, in, uh, does this task interfere or integrate with the natural uh, arm dynamics, especially in this case, the natural coupling between the arms and the legs. And this goes back to the Ford study. Uh, so what we see here is the coupling between the arms and legs as a function of gait speed. And the dark solid line is the normal situation when there are no arm constraints. We see that arm leg coupling goes from more predominantly two to one at low speeds to about one to one at high gait speeds. And this is what's been shown before. This was the original work that Robert and I showed uh, in uh, the transition from two to one to one to one. So the black line is the natural pattern that we see in the arms and certainly the arm leg coupling. Um, but when uh, one arm is constrained, we see that the um, uh, coupling goes in the constrained arm stays kind of in the more two to one mode and then at higher speeds goes into kind of no coupling. And uh, the opposite arm still kind of maintains that, that general pattern, although it's slightly, uh, slightly changed. So this is what the effects is of, again, of a constrained situation when there's arm constraint, what happens to that arm and the contralateral arm when we uh, increase gait speed. So obviously that's an artificial, to some degree, artificial condition, although in some cases we might have a unilateral a lack of arm movement. But in a lot of daily activities, we see that the arm is used to do something else, like in Lino's study, uh, carrying objects or transporting objects. And so this is the same analysis, gate speed on the horizontal axis, the relative power uh, index between the arms and the legs, two to one is at the bottom in red, the one-to-one -one coupling mode is on top. And what we see is in the triangles here, the natural tendencies again. So it's, although in this experiment, not quite starts at two-to-one, this is again variable. This can vary between populations, but certainly we see the increase to a strong one-to-one -one at higher gate speed. So this is walking only. The second condition that Leno had was walking just with a cup. So what happens when you hold something in your arm while you're walking? As you can see from this, that kind of creates undetermined coordination dynamics between the arms and the legs. Uh, basically, as a function of gait speed, uh, it, it's 
a little bit more one-to-one, -one, but it's very weakly so. So there's no clear coupling. But when we now have what he called the cup and the ball, so in the cup and ball task, the attractor now is more towards two to one, although it certainly is not a full two to one mode. It certainly seems to be more attracted to the two to one coupling, even at higher gate speeds. So even at 1.4, um, the coupling between the arm and the leg becomes um, uh, uh, more in the direction of a two to one coupling. And this makes sense because in order to carry out that task, you need to deal with disturbances that probably are related to stepping frequency. So the arm in this case is more <laughs> geared towards the stepping frequency, even at higher gate speed. So kind of um, going against the natural coordination dynamics that uh, you would otherwise see uh, in this case in uh, uh, during walking only. Okay, so clear adaptation from say, stride to step, or at least more attracted towards the stepping frequency in a task that requires uh, manual precision control uh, in that case. Interestingly, Lino also found some changes in the way that the upper body is coordinated. So on the left, we see the very typical change. So we have gate speed on the horizontal axis. And this is the continuous relative phase between the pelvis and the thorax. Again, low speeds, we move in phase, high speeds, we move antiphase. We see that change from in phase to antiphase. Interestingly, the coordination variability of that phase relationship increased when we do the ball and cup task uh, compared to uh, just walking only, that you can see here in the triangles. So walking only compared to ball and cup. And we had two conditions in this experiment, walking with the ball and cup and also doing visual tasks in terms of dynamic visual acuity. In both cases, we see an increase in the variability of the coordination. And that variability increase in this case, is probably, we would argue is functional because it helped maintain, in this case, the, uh, the, ball, the conceptual task of uh, maintaining that ball within the cup, within the target area. Okay, so the functionality of that variability in this case is clearly shown by the effect it has on the, uh, in this case, carrying out the uh, object transport task. The final experiment I want to talk to you a little bit about in this in this paradigm is work I've been doing with Natalia Ronaldo and Renato Moraz in Brazil. And this team, they both Natalia and Renato have done a lot of work on walking and grasping. And I won't go into the details of all their work. They show very clear uh, impacts on the walking dynamics, <clears throat> the integration of the walking and grasping and prehension and grasping dynamics, and also adaptation at the level of the, the grasping itself. I wanna share a few slides uh, from their work and the work that we've done together and the changes that, that you can see. So in normal walking, as we've seen before, the coupling between the arms is predominantly antiphase, and you see that right here. But when we walk and grasp, we need to change that coordination. So we need to reduce that antiphase motion as you see here <clears throat> and increase the amount of in-phase motion. So it's kind of, Again, a breaking of the natural intrinsic dynamics towards what we call the task dynamics involved in <clears throat> walking and grasping. And that doesn't only happen in uh, the sagittal plane, flexion extension, it also happens in the frontal plane. Uh, what we see here, and especially see some changes in older adults. So in the, in the ABA deduction component, um, we see that the coordination in younger adults is more in phase compared to older adults and older adults who fall, meaning that say shoulder abduction and picking up an object is compensated for by shoulder abduction in the contralateral um, <clears throat> arm. And uh, arguably this is obviously for stability reasons. And this is systematically reduced in older adults <clears throat> and also a little bit more in, in those who fall, although not significantly different. Okay, So clearly adjustments or changes in the frontal plane are important as well as the aging study here shows. Interestingly, when we look, compare older fallers and non-fallers, uh, on the vertical axis here, we have the temporal differences between heel contact and reaching onset. And what we see is that at the um, start, uh, at uh, older uh, fallers here, um, Positive means heel contact is before the reach. So they don't start their reach 
before they've made heel contact, whereas older non-fallers or healthy older adults, they start their reach before heel contact. So they actually integrate the reaching movement much more fluidly and consistently with the walking dynamics compared to older uh, non-fallers, meaning older, fa older, older fallers have to clearly kind of disconnect the two components. They cannot integrate their walking dynamics with their reaching and grasping dynamics is the message from, from this work. And then finally, in some more recent work, what we did is uh, manipulate the link between the support leg and the reaching and grasping arm. Naturally, what we do is um, we typically have ipsilateral support. So let's say we grasp with our, with our right hand, we have right foot, right leg support, or we grasp with our left hand, we have left uh, foot support. But we did some manipulations forcing people to do this contralaterally. And interestingly, when we do that, we see a reduction in the dynamic stability. So in this case, actually we use Hoff's margin of dynamic stability and zero to negative means it's, it's unstable. This is in the medial lateral direction and contralateral uh, hand pickup. So object pickup and leg support clearly leads to uh, unstable center of mass dynamics, uh, as you can see from this image. <coughs> Okay, one more section. So this is the last one. Um, and this is on um, the integration between biomechanics and motor control and the control of head movements and integrating uh, some of the work that uh, Joe has done <clears throat> and has built a significant body of uh, expertise on. There's lower extremity function, shock attenuation, and some of my work and interest in motor control and definitely uh, upper body control as well as uh, uh, visual perception. And uh, <clears throat> to give you a little bit of the background, um, the in terms of head stabilization, <clears throat> there's a number of reflexes that can help us do this, right? So vestibular colic reflex stabilizes head mo uh, headed space motion by activating neck muscles. So for example, vertical translation of the body um, is compensated for by counterbalancing head pitch through this vestibular colic reflex. Similarly, stretch reflex neck muscles through the uh, cervical colic reflex uh, stabilizes the head with respect to the trunk. And these two reflexes <clears throat> work together and their relationship is complex in uh, maintaining head stability. The other important, of course, reflexive function is uh, compensatory eye movements in response to head movements through the vestibular ocular reflex. It uh, plays a role in many different uh, <clears throat> gaze adjustments and, and gaze stabilization situations. However, it's not always functional, it has limits. And for example, um, it works properly under head rotational velocities up to about 350 degrees per second. But after that, it, it becomes more uh, uh, difficult to just rely on, on that mechanism. So here you see some examples, this is from work by Moore et al, of the, the head stabilization in space. So what we see here is head pitch, the dashed line, in response to trunk or head vertical translation, so nicely uh, anti-phase motion. What that does is it keeps what we call the vert vertically projected head fixation distance constant, so in this case it keeps head orientation constant with respect to uh, spatial uh, external uh, frames of reference. Um, the same for the vertical, for the horizontal one. In this case, it's head yaw, response opposite to, so counter uh, X, the uh, lateral translation of the center of mass, now keeping the horizontally projected head fixation uh, distance constant. Okay, so these are two examples of. Uh, Head, head equilibrium in space and, and, and the mechanisms that we have available to do that. Interestingly, what we've developed is something similar, but now projecting uh, what we call the uh, proximal visual inter intersect on the surface, on the ground surface uh, during walking. This uses the Frankfurt plane and the 65 degree inclination from that. Uh, again, this is some work that my student, Jeb Romelius, developed. And uh, this has certainly uh, helped us identify some changes uh, in that uh, head, uh, in this case, projection of the head on the ground surface between MS and controls, where we can see that uh, 
uh, people with MS maintain a much larger distance uh, of that PVI in comparison to the center of mass compared to controls. And this happens at a variety of speeds. And this is clearly needed uh, probably in terms of uh, visual control of their stepping uh, and, and, and uh, probably compensating for lack of cutaneous, which has been shown consistently, as well as proprioceptive um, information uh, from the lower extremities. Clearly head control is impacted by vestibular deficits and there's lots of work on this and as you can see from some of these examples early work by Pozzo et al showed poor coordination of head and body center of gravity um, head movements uh, tend to be increased uh, and increased acceleration in the different planes uh, with vestibular deficits and clearly head movements are much more fragmented they're less smooth in comparison to normal compensations that we see uh, in people with vestibular deficits. So clearly head control is, is something that's impacted in vestibular deficit uh, situations. Now what I want to show you here is some of the work that we did with Joe on um, integrating uh, shock attenuation and how that impacts control of the head. As we indicated early on, uh, some of the reflexive mechanisms that help us do that certainly have their limits. Uh, so for example, the VOR gain, which measures or assesses the change in eye angle uh, in comparison to the change in head angle, ideally that should be zero, one, sorry, one, can be as low as 0.75 during running, meaning a lot of these mechanisms reach their limits uh, during running. So in order to account for that, we need active control mechanisms uh, to stabilize the head in space. And this is something we, we investigated in a series of studies relating against shock attenuation to active head control and visual perception. And this was done with our postdoctoral uh, fellows, uh, Mike Busa and, and uh, jong El Lim uh, in 16 and 17. To, before we get into that, talk a little bit more about Joe has made significant contributions in his career to understanding impact or shock attenuation and the mechanisms uh, during running behind that. And this is an example of that. We nicely see that uh, from low impact to high impact, when we go from high stride frequencies, short stride lengths to um, uh, long stride lengths, we see an increase in the impact peak um, at the tibia but we see a, a consistent peak impact peak at the head. So meaning we have consistent shock attenuation at the level of the head going say from about six to eight Gs to one Gs. And this is across a range of stride lengths and the same can be applied to, uh, to gait speeds. So what we wanted to do in this study here and, 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 by, and just, just to backtrack, Joe's work has very consistently shown together with, with uh, Ken Holt and Tim Derrick, for example, in this study, that the way that this shock attenuation is accomplished is through very consistent changes in the kinematic patterns throughout the body. Um, but the implications or the, the sense that this would be important for head control and visual perception has never been quite completed in the sense that uh, yes, so there is reduction or attenuation of the impact at the level of the head as this study clearly shows, but does it actually, uh, lead to changes in, 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 in perceptual aspects. So in this series of studies, what we did, we reversed it. We imposed different visual perceptual uh, demands on participants and then investigated how, uh, how that attenuation and that those demands were uh, accomplished uh, successfully. So what we did was uh, have people run at their preferred speed. They had a pointer at the head, that pointer would have to be kept within boxes of different sizes, starting from large to progressively smaller sizes. So this is an increase in visual task demand from visual angle of say 21 to three. So this is a hard visual task, meaning there's a high demand on head stabilization. Here's a much lower demand on head stabilization. And what we found certainly, this, and this shows the task. So people have much larger amount of head movement here and they pretty well are, are managing uh, to stabilize the head uh, under the extreme visual task conditions. What we found in general was that um, 
this, this whole range of uh, different visual task demands did not change the passive, the, the impact that they had, as certainly was suggested before. We see systematic changes in the, uh, the lower frequency ranges in the ex active acceleration of the head. And that's something we can see here in the frequency spectrum of the, the head acceleration, the head power. So the impact peak doesn't change as a function of visual task demands that you see here, uh, but there is a significantly lower peak power and power values for the head at visual angles that become smaller and smaller, in this case from say nine to, to three degrees of visual angle. So clearly active uh, uh, changes in the control of the head. And those active changes are related to a variety of significant changes at the lower extremities that I won't go into detail. This is like increased uh, knee flexion and toe off. Uh, so there's clear changes in the lower extremities. But interestingly, there's also changes in the way that, the, coming back to the coordination story, there's also a change in the way that the different segments are coordinated. And we did this through vector, what we call vector coding analysis analyzing the relative motion between segments, in this case here, for example, hip and knee, and quantifying that, uh, and especially quantifying their variability. And what we found was that in the second phase of stance, or so those active adjustments with increasing visual task demands are seen in the second uh, phase of stance, second part of the stance phase, the propulsion phase. And importantly, this is observed both at the trunk head coupling. So this is the trunk vertical head sagittal coupling. We see increase in coordination and variability, but also in the lower extremities. So both upper extremity head trunk coupling, as well as lower extremity hip knee coupling, we see increased variability with increased visual task amounts. And we use a very exciting technique called statistical parametric mapping as developed by Pataki and colleagues to identify where in the stride cycle, in this case, stance cycle, we see these um, perturbation or the, these adjustments, in this case, in variability. All right, we're almost there. Just a few minutes to change, to go to the last section of the talk. And this is some of the really most recent work coming out of the lab. That's again, very in, uh, intriguing and integrating a lot of the biomechanical and motor control research. And this is now, the majority of what I've been talking about is related to straight lines, I mean, basically straight path locomotion, either walking or running. <clears throat> and this addresses work and changing direction. And certainly been a, a lot of prior work on this, especially by uh, Atlas, Atlas work. Um, and uh, looking at how, what are the strategies in terms of changing direction? We know that clearly directional change often follows initial saccade, eye movements, head movements, and then uh, general heading movement, and then followed by trunk uh, and pelvis motion. So this sequence is very often called the steering synergy. So kind of head motion or initially a head or a saccade would initiate this, this sequence uh, of motor commands going from, uh, in this case, head change of head rotation to a heading change and pelvic and thoracic adjustment so that eventually the body is aligned with a new travel direction. Um, this is something we've been investigating in some of our recent work on um, cutting movements. And this is with uh, uh, Jill Ware, a postdoc in Joe's lab, and my, my grad student, uh, Sam Zeff. Um, so what we're interested in here is, is uh, the integration really between lower extremity dynamics and upper body dynamics in these what we call sidestepping or cutting movements. Jill's interest is, is uh, a lot in terms of lower extremity injuries. So how are, for example, anticipated and unanticipated cutting movements, sidestepping movements executed differently that might relate to lower extremity injuries. Sam's work is very much interested in uh, in concussions and um, how maybe these paradigms could be important in identifying um, changes in the head control that of course could happen with concussion and how that might just inform us about uh, potential issues for example related to return of play in, in people with concussion. So um, here you very nicely see the differences of course between straight line running 
uh, cutting that's in the center section anticipated and, and cutting in the, on the right that is unanticipated. So very different upper body and lower uh, body uh, kinematics and certainly what we also show uh, kinetics and dynamics. All right, let me stop those. So the paradigm is the side cutting movement in, in this, as you can see here. And again, these were anticipated or unanticipated. So either people knew before they started running whether they had to cut or not or run straight through. Or in the other case, an unanticipated people would just uh, be getting the signal to cut just, just before they had to make the cut. So this is a very kind of unanticipated condition. What Jill's shown in her work so far is that these, these two different paradigms have clear impacts on, say, lower extremity uh, kinetics. And for example, she found increased knee valgus moments during unanticipated sidestepping, especially, again, using statistical parametric mapping uh, from, say, 23 to 36 percent of stands. Coordination analysis, again, using vector coding, indicated in her work that um, in unanticipated sidestepping, the hip is not as much extended to propel the body forward, and that has consequences for the knee as well. So the knee must generate uh, much more, actually, majority of the propulsion uh, to do this, and these elevated knee moments, certainly uh, in unanticipated sidestepping, can certainly be related to, uh, to injury risk. So that's a kind of brief summary of, of her work on lower extremity, although of course much more has been done on that. Sam's work focused more on the upper body. And what he found was that when you compare anticipated and unanticipated sidestepping, that the head is more orient oriented towards the new travel direction when adequate planning is provided. So during an anticipated sidestepping and that the trunk is more op oriented in the opposite direction of travel during the unanticipated an condition, so when the planning time is reduced. Now, some of these are, are to some degree expected, uh, but those are clearly differences in how the head and trunk are oriented, in this case, at the beginning of that site or during that sidestepping motion. But what I want to show here as well is that, so then the sidestepping is, as we see here, pretty much kind of requires adjustments and changes in uh, the transverse plane, especially when it relates to the upper body. But what the last slides here are going to show is that the sidestepping motion also impacts significantly the coordination dynamics in the other planes. In this case, going back to the coordination between uh, trunk, the trunk Z, so trunk Z is trunk up down versus head pitch. In normal running, that's predominantly, this is green bar shows, antiphase. But in sidestepping, that becomes almost a reduction in half. So the antiphase component is, is reduced. And we see other coordination patterns uh, emerge uh, in, uh, during, uh, during sidestepping motion. And so what that means is that not only are the coordination dynamics in the primary plane of motion in the upper body impacted in the anticipated and unanticipated condition, but the coordination dynamics could also be impacted in, uh, in other planes. And these graphs finally show that this is the stance phase. This is the oscillations of the uh, trunk and the um, uh, head pitch. And they're in running, normal running, nicely antiphase, as you can see here. Okay, so the green is the trunk and the dashed line is the head. And uh, throughout most of stands, this is what we focus on, their antiphase. And then in sidestepping, um, they're still antiphase in the first part of stands, so in kind of the weight acceptance. But in the second part of stands, that coupling is, is uh, uh, basically um, uh, changed and we, we get a move away from the antiphase. What that means is still unclear. Uh, could obviously the natural now dynamics, the natural compensatory dynamics of the head to the trunk seem to be impacted. And then the question is eventually that we want to try to argue next is what does that mean uh, for the control of the head in space? And for example, uh, perceiving relevant aspects during these cutting movements that might be relevant, for example, for an athlete uh, that are important in terms of uh, making the right decisions.
or maybe avoiding potential injury. All right, so that was it. So uh, hopefully with this, uh, these four sections, you got some idea about um, the, the role of the upper body in locomotor control, right? So I took you from kind of a bit of a historical perspective, what we know about the different components, the arms, the pelvis, the thorax, the head, to the coordination dynamics and how intrinsic coordination dynamics need to be integrated with manual task performance to the, the final section here that we just discussed where um, we look at head control, um, but uh, clearly the contribution of the entire body to head control and, and what that means for potentially for injury as, as, uh, as well as perception. So thanks very much. I wanna acknowledge some of my funders for the past few uh, years to do this. And very importantly, other than the people I've acknowledged throughout the talk, a uh, list of uh, grad students, current formal so postdoctoral students who have made uh, significant contributions to uh, the research in the lab. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so let us, maybe you can stop sharing your screen and then uh, we can see each other a little bit better. Uh, so if you stop sharing, then we will see each other a bit better. Okay, wonderful. All right, so uh, wake up everybody. Uh, if you have questions, I think we can begin. Who is ready? Okay, Monica, please, and then Gregor. Okay, so thanks Richard for the nice presentation. So a few years ago, we published a paper where we look at interactions between arm muscles and the trunk. Mm -hmm. um, so what was interesting in that paper is that at, at that point, this was done with a uh, collaboration with Paul Stratton in the UK and one of uh, his postdoctoral fellows. So people have shown that if you contract uh, deltoid or the biceps, you can facilitate muscles in the track in terms of corticospinal excitability. So in that paper, we show that actually you can observe the same effects, similar effects if you contract the finger muscle. So by contracting finger muscle, you can also facilitate corticospinal responses in the trunk. So I was wondering about the interactions that you show with your arm swing. Uh, we're looking for a strategies for our patients to become more stable. So you show us some data that suggests that arm swing, you know, the magnitude of the arm swing is changing trunk stability. So I'm wondering is that is coming from the distal part of the arm or the proximal, or, or what is your view about? Because, you know, there is more excursion of the arm and maybe that could be a, a different strategy if we target more the distal or the proximal arm to, to increase trunk stability in, in our patients. So. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a great question. So the, I, I don't think, at least I'm not aware, but that doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, uh, uh, most of the work I, I showed you really pertains to overall arm swing. I mean, it was only the very early work by uh, Murray that showed the differences between say shoulder and elbow. So it's very clear that the different parts of the arm could, could have different uh, uh, contributions. So a lot of, I mean, obviously there's not a lot of work looking at say the relative contribution of elbow motion during arm swing, but it's the, I, probably the idea is that, I mean, I discussed a little bit uh, the controversy or at least the, the discussion between passive and active aspects of arm swing. I, I think a lot of people probably would argue that especially the, 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 from the elbow on, maybe that is certainly more passive, that if anything else is active, that is the control maybe just the overall arm at the shoulder. Um, but but that, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's truly the case. Um, so, so to be clear, so you're asking is maybe more focus on uh, increasing arm or hand motions during walking? Would yeah, be yeah. I mean, because, you know, uh, uh, in those years, I think Paul Stratton conducted st studies and uh, Peter Ellaway and others where they show that if you contract the deltoid or, or biceps, actually you facilitate corticospinal excitability in muscles, contralateral, the paraspinal muscles. 
So we ask the same question, but now we ask people to contract the hand, different intrinsic hand muscles, and also biceps, triceps, and a group of muscles. And uh, it was interesting that also you can get an interaction. You know, if you contract the muscle of the hand, you can also facilitate. So, and it was quite strong uh, 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 compared to the facilitation that we got from more proximal yeah. muscles. So. You know, when you're moving your arm and you know you have a larger excursion, I'm wondering if if the the stability comes from interactions. Is is it driven to the same extent by interactions from the more distal part of the arm or is the more proximal part of the arm? But it's very important. Yeah, no, that, and and that's great. You mentioned that because I think that's an important addition to 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 my third section, right? So because that the, the work I presented there is very much on integration of locomotor dynamics and manual and precision performance. Uh, this is mostly being done then in, in, in younger <clears throat> and older adults. I think in terms of rehabilitation procedures, then it's, it's not just important maybe to facilitate arm movement, but definitely maybe facilitate much more uh, skilled hand movements that might then overall uh, just, just basically create a lot more plasticity for me in, in terms of not just the spinal cord, but cortical spinal interactions, right? So I think, Monica, what uh, you mentioned is uh, those experiments were run when the subjects had a, were in a postural state. Yeah. They yeah. were not moving. So no. it, may, yeah. it may be specific to uh, postural states when really, as Richard mentioned, small manipulation may require higher postural stability than large proximal movements of the arm. Mm -hmm. Although they in, involve very small muscle activations, relatively speaking. But like if you're fixing a watch or something, uh, you would like uh, your postural stability mm -hmm. to be nearly perfect. No. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may be related to the difference between locomotor movement versus postural tasks. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think there is a, a Kappa Day uh, years ago show also that these interactions are present during pointing. You know, if you point uh, these interactions between the distal and more proximal and trunk muscles were present, but goes in the same idea that Mark, you're, you're suggesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Gregor. So uh, thanks for this this wonderful talk that uh, helped me catch up with something I haven't followed so much. Um, so a very general question: you, you often using this uh, notion of relative phase, especially in this pelvic uh, thorax uh, relationship, but also elsewhere. Um, and, and does that mean that, or, or do you do that because the spatial extent of the movement is then relatively invariant as the phase changes, or are there always spatial and temporal co-changes. Yeah, that, that was certainly the initial, because uh, the, 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 the use of the relative phase was certainly a lot, um, we used it a lot in our earlier work and definitely that was, was inspired by a lot of the early work you did with, with Scott on, on this, that we thought that the, the essential dynamics or changes in, 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 in uh, would be more, we would be more sensitive to detect that through continuous relative phase than purely spatial. Um, what we have discovered along the way though, is that especially clinically, um, and, and my colleague Joe will, will certainly share in that assessment, it's, very, it's, it's actually much harder to, to identify with people what's going on because now it's not just as you indicate, it's not just a spatial aspect is it's a spatial temporal aspect. And what we what we observe very often is that people still interpreted the, the continuous relative phase almost invariably based on spatial uh, aspects. So in, in the past few years, we focused a little bit more on the spatial components using actually vector coding, which is allows us to do that, right? So because that that goes back to the a lot of the original kind of angle angle diagrams, angle angle the motion plots that were very early on identified in the clinical literature. So we, we have focused a bit more on that, but still the case that, and we certainly have some papers on that, 
using continuous relative phase with, with, on, with, with phase planes and spatial temporal dynamics, certainly it doesn't give you necessarily the same information as the pure spatial analysis. So there's definitely some differences. Yeah, I, I understand. Uh, maybe for clarification, I just point out that the, you know, the, when you look at a phase picture, you're essentially trying to look at pure timing or coordination yeah. and, and, you know, think of once some space is invariant. And that is something, a good description for, for this finger twiddling stuff. Uh, in, when it's purely a question of neural coordination of different neural processes, you know, being in, uh, in different relationships. Uh, while if you have mechanical coupling, as you have when you move a whole limb, you know, and, and the whole body movement and locomotion, then of course that's very difficult to achieve uh, if it, uh, because these mechanical systems um, have you know, eigenfrequencies and particular uh, modes. And uh, when you change your phase relationship, then their intrinsic uh, amplitude, you know, the resonance essentially, or you know, how much energy would go into that mode change. So it would make a more special demand on the nervous system to keep timing and spacing uh, separate. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't be so surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that it is more complex than, than that. Yeah, so again, based on, on, on that consideration, so the, the third and fourth parts of my talk, and, and certainly the more current work from our lab, uh, focus has, has used much more the vector coding. So we use the spatial. So, so both in terms of the, uh, well, especially the last part, looking at, say, the integration between head and trunk motion, uh, those, those are now purely spatial analysis. So we're not making, well, the only temporal interpretations we're making is based on how are these spatial changes occurring throughout the stride cycle. So when, in say the stance phase, do we see a shift in, in that coordination? So that's, that brings in some of the temporal part, but not the way originally certainly seen in terms of the phase plane analysis. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other quick questions from those on Zoom? Uh, all right, then why don't we switch to the questions from the audience? So open chat if you haven't done so that yet, Richard. And yep. uh, I, well, you can read them, right? Yeah, I'll go to the first. <clears throat> this is Jose Praia, Bernstein School. Left asymmetry arm is connected to right asymmetry on right leg. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, Jose. Is the um, I don't know if that reflects the, the finding I relate or reflected on healthy gait that there is um, increased arm swing on the left that seems to be consistent in lots of research. Um, so I, I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> That's not good for the first question, but. So the second, do tension on upper joints influence lower ones? Um, I guess the easy answer is yes. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean with tension. So the, um, the, the idea certainly is that um, as, as, as I showed in the last part of, of the talk, when we look at the stepping, the sidestepping dynamics, we, we, tend, we like to say that the different orientations of the trunk and head have a very significant impact on the lower extremity dynamics. So in this case, for example, the knee moments. Uh, so in a general sense, the answer is yes, but it's not the tension of the upper joints. It's really kind of the, the different uh, rotations, the different orientations, and probably the different coordinations that might impact the lower extremity uh, moments in, in this case. And then the third is, does rigidity of the trunk influence step length? Um, uh, that, that's, that's a good question. I mean, the, the two are related. So I think what my wor or the, the work on this showed is that to increase gait speed, which of course requires an increase in step length, uh, we need to uh, reduce thoracic or trunk rotations. And, and what Kubo's work has shown and argues is that the apparent trunk stiffness is important in that, but also to regulate or allow increased arm swings. So I think what the work so far, what I, what I presented, 
today clearly shows is the increased arm swing is highly necessary for countering the angular momentum generated by uh, the lower extremities. And, and, and the, the work that I reviewed clearly showed, so both Collins's work and Umberger's work, that if you don't, so if you don't allow arm swing, we see significant increases in metabolic energy expenditure that can be 10 to 12% as well as uh, impact the, uh, the free moment that will again then increase internal moments that will require energy expenditure uh, again. So, um, so the... Okay, uh, Richard, may I interrupt you for a second because it wouldn't be uh, a virtual motor control school session without a question from Anatole. So since Anatole is ready to ask, uh, I'm going to ask him uh, to interrupt your uh, mini session with the uh, written questions. So Anatole. Uh, I'm sorry, I sent uh, my question by email, but uh, perhaps uh, I did it wrong and uh, you didn't get the question. So uh, um, Richard, do you uh, in your Nice talk, uh, of course. Uh, you acknowledge that uh, uh, the commotion is a uh, uh, result of a translation of balance and stability in the environment. Uh, and um, uh, so you acknowledge so this, but uh, um, uh, it would be nice um, if you. Uh, uh, explain um, some data, uh, very rich data in your talk um, using this language. For instance, uh, for me, uh, it would be uh, a straightforward uh, answer to, to a question because ba translation balance, balance and stability uh, involves the whole board. So of course, uh, are, uh, are involved. Uh, in this process. Um, so the question is very passive or active, is uh, actually out of question, it's active. Uh, the other piece thing, um, uh, so other feature, feature as uh, we demonstrated in the past, like a phase is setting is straightforward of this hypothesis. So if you per talk, uh, uh, delay the transfer of balance by some deterioration, you have phase resetting, okay? And um, uh, I even think, uh, and we can, uh, by communicating uh, via email, to answer to the question why, based on idea of transfer balance and stability, you can explain uh, hysteresis in uh, post, in uh, uh, in uh, in the diagram of velocity uh, uh, okay uh, so we can we can, can communicate uh, uh, i don't uh, i have some vague idea how to explain this but we can think about uh, by communicating by by email and we could uh, write a, a short communication about this so um, I just uh, wish you could uh, more intensively use the language of transfer balance and stability, especially for human locomotion, uh, even if uh, uh, the idea is applicable to quadrupeds quadripec as well. Okay, thank you. Perfect, we'll, we'll do that. I would love to, and I fully agree that, that um, uh, I, mean, I, I just reviewed that it's still ongoing. I mean, the, the discussions about the passive versus active role of the arms is, is, is what people still debate. And I hope I've made a little bit clear that that's not the relevant question. And I think clearly that that fits with, with your, your perspective. And things are clearly without, and I think the research shows that without active control, uh, it, it, it's not going to happen. And, and, and to be honest, I mean, it was a small bullet uh, we've shown that for even uh, the swing dynamics uh, that are, are typically still typically seen as fully under passive 
dynamic control, or at least regular dominated by passive dynamics, only about 30% might be called passive on that. So fully agree. All right, so back to the written questions. Thank you, Richard. Um, all right. The fourth question again comes from Jose. Did you separate front and backward extended arm swing? No, we haven't looked at that, but clearly people have looked at potential differences between say flexion and extension. So there's definitely some, some literature on that, but I, I didn't quite uh, review that. Um, five, are there Renzo Pozzo, are there any kind of relationships in the coordination pattern between father and son? Oh, wow. Are there coordination patterns somewhat hereditary or mirror neurons can explain this well-known similarity? That's an interesting question. Um, I assume you mean like do parents and children work, walk in similar ways? I, I don't know. Uh, that's actually a, a very interesting question. Um, the, I mean, clearly there are very distinct gait patterns that we all know, right? So obviously we, uh, in, in our lab, the biomechanics lab at UMass Amherst, there's a not, lot of work on running. And of course, us in, in, in kinesiology or exercise science are always interested in running patterns. Um, and running patterns are so different between people. I mean, the first marathon I watched in the Boston Marathon, I just couldn't believe even at the top finishers how different running patterns can be between uh, elite athletes, especially in terms of some of the arm motions even there. Um, so I don't know, that's an interesting question. So maybe someone can research that. Um, Daniela Matos, is there any control mechanisms embedded into the relative phase or is this purely descriptive? That's a great question. Comes back to a bit of, uh, of Gregor's original question. Um, I mean, the relative phase is, is very much focused on, on timing aspects. And, and, and of course, what Gregor's been doing a lot is trying to link this to certainly underlying control mechanisms. For, for now, we've used it more or less descriptively. We would see it in terms of clinical applications or uh, is, is the inclusion uh, of, of looking at face plane changes may be more sensitive than just purely uh, displacement alone. So for now, yes, but of course others uh, have, have uh, used this much more um, conceptually. Um, seven, this is Nikita Kuchnisov. This is in relation to the first section. Are there gender differences in arm swing in terms of canceling angular momentum of the lower limbs during walking? Uh, not sure, it's, that's a great question. And, and the work that I reviewed, people have not directly assessed gender differences, but there very well might be uh, gender differences. Um, same person, or is there a leading arm? Uh, well, so that's, it, it, it looks like if you ask leading arm, is there a symmetry? That's what the review showed. And it seems that the leading arm, at least in regular locomotion, seems to be pretty much the left arm, but it's still pretty unclear why that is. Um, but maybe it comes back to integrating uh, the right arm is more used to, again, a, a lot of the research on locomotion has dealt with just gait. And, and so what I reviewed in section three is just the beginning of research that's starting to look at the integration of locomotion with in this case, manual task performance. <clears throat> but of course, in real and in, in, in daily life, this is what we do all the time. I mean, we carry things, we transport things. So we actually consistently integrating our locomotor dynamics with manual performance. So maybe what we already have acquired is that we are focusing more on right, at least for the predominant part of the population, focusing on the right limb as being involved in terms of manual performance that maybe then by, by default, the left is taken over more in terms of stabilizing gait because <clears throat> the comp, as we've shown, right? So that when we prevent unilateral arm motion, the contralateral arm increases its amplitude. So it could very well be that, um, that the left has taken that over. And I think that would need to be investigated in more detail. 
follow up a quick follow up comment because we ran a relevant well kind of relevant study when we asked people to march uh, in place naturally and then voluntarily stop one of the arms the other arm increases the amplitude of swing nearly instantaneously mm -hmm. and we tried right and left and there were no differences mm -hmm. that we could uh, find out so it looks like the left arm is pretty good at compensating for the right arm swing and the right arm is pretty good at compensating the left yeah. arm swing okay. but again the null effect is a weak finding so uh maybe there is something there yeah. but yeah. your point is well taken of course Thank well but that's an interesting study so in that case so, but but people were standing or were they walking uh they were uh we did it with marching in place yeah 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 Okay. so it's kind of walking but without tr translating the body but we also did it when we asked people simply to swing their arms pretending that they could be walking without moving their feet at all mm -hmm. and you get the same result okay uh, which by the way tells you that the effect is not to compensate for the angular momentum rotational because when they stand the legs do not produce any momentum, but the arms still try to do uh, something uh, that looks meaningless. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so question nine is again from Jose Praia. May horizontal head variation influence gait asymmetry or speed? Um, and I assume you mean with horizontal variation just to yeah, I don't know what, what Mark is doing. I don't know if you mean the head yaw, so the rotation of the head, or just the horizontal displacement of the head in in in, in space. But um, the of course some of the early reflexes reflect like a, a head yaw, like a head rotation and, and arm movement, right? So these are obviously seen in in uh, uh, in early infancy. So. Uh, but the idea is typically that that disappears, although there are some intriguing proposals that that might still be the case, or that that um, that that basically head rotation in one direction elicits uh, reflexive actions in the in the contralateral limb or arm, uh, but that certainly is not supposed to maintain. So that um, so not not necessarily, uh, but it certainly could be. I mean, there head rotation. Um, so I, I don't know if you mean um, that that uh, during the rotation we see a change in the in the coupling between the legs. That would be an interesting question. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, well, Marco said, "Nice talk, you all the best." So ten, Daniela Matos, related to the speed and movement coordination. Have you ever thought about their interactions with the HIIT concept and its benefits. HIIT is maybe and, this is HET. It's HIIT. Well, I also saw it as HIIT, but I wonder whether this is a typo or this is really it, because I don't know HIIT. Well, if she means HET, that that's pretty clear. I mean, that this the, this is the. I mean, the, one, one of the early rationales of the Umberger study in two thousand and eight, and I mean, intensity I, interval training. That's it. That's it. High intensity interval training. So, um, interval training. this is an interesting question. Would high intensity interval training change coordination? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I assume you're talking about running. Um, so, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I didn't really review that. Um, but, but potentially, of course, the answer is yes, different types of training could, could impact arm movements as well as arm, uh, the relation of the arms to the trunk in, in runners, that's for sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure how that would relate to um, rehabilitation science, and maybe that's what you're getting to. Um, so that, that's a good question, whether high intensity but the question is, what's the type of training, right? That will be the essential thing. If there is not... a follow up, two questions later, there is a follow up by Daniela that may clarify what she means. 
like number 12, in terms of met metabolism, muscle recovery in the context of performance, oh, and lesion prevention. Um, yeah, that, that's, th those are links at this point, of course, that would be, we're far from being able to say anything about, right? So the, uh, clearly what I've shown in the review is that changes in the coordination dynamics or in the, even the absence or presence of, in this case, arm swing impacts uh, energy metabolism and, and, and expenditure. Um, and, and clearly absent arm swing then increases that expenditure as I also showed the absence of arm swing increases the free moment that requires more internal um, and external uh, 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 compensation in terms of moments. So, uh, so it's probably in terms of increased uh, energy metabolism and muscle activity requires more. Uh, uh, so you get greater activity. So it depends what, what your target is. If uh, sometimes from an exercise science perspective, if you want to improve people's physical activity levels, you want to increase energy metabolism or energy expenditure. Um, in optimal performance, in terms of athletes, you want to decrease that. So it depends a little bit on, on the goals. Okay. Um, Richard, I, I have a question. Um, can I? Yeah. So uh, thank you for that elegant presentation. It's so nice to hear you review very uh, clearly the, very, the, the different elements uh, related to walking. Um, my question is very broad and maybe I'm, maybe, I don't know, maybe you answered it different ways, but I'd like to know if you, in terms of, um, in terms of rehab, a lot of the uh, issues or the things that you've been investigating have very practical implications for rehab. So, I mean, if you were to sort of broadly look at the work you're doing, what would you say is the main message you want to give to rehab rehabilitation practitioners? who think that we have to get some back, we have to try to teach people some kind of ideal actions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, th there are probably several, but the first that comes to mind, and this, this, is, this is why I showed that kind of in the first slide on the coordination dynamics is, is, uh, is when, when we manipulate, in this case, speed as a control parameter, so we both increase and decrease it, we show some of the flexibility uh, in, in, in patterns or, or the, the differences that we can see. So the, probably the main message is that, um, especially if, wanna, if we want to improve gait, then um, gait dynamics, that we want to take people through a range of, of gait speeds because, it, for example, increasing arm swing by itself is uh, it's also dependent on gait speed. You might have people walk very slowly, and if you then try to increase arm swing, that is a that, that's kind of unnatural. So it goes against the natural gait dynamics. So you want to link your intervention probably also more clearly to uh, to a range of gait speeds. And as we show clearly, and I think that's pretty consistently, that um, we can see some different patterns depending on whether, for example, you're you're increasing. Uh, that gate speed versus decreasing that gate speed. So that, that's a manipulation that could facilitate some plasticity uh, and, and adaptability in the patterns. Um, that, that, that's kind of the first, uh, at least in that, on that front that comes to mind. Um, I don't know if that truly answers your question, but... Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I think I think it's an important point that uh, that we have to look at the range of different tasks and how they and and but but I think it's about adaptability. I, I think that's what you're saying too. That we you know people will have to we have to you demonstrate. I mean the, the beautiful demonstration that you have to increase the um, the. Uh, the variability of the action in order for the task to be accomplished properly it was really a nice uh, demonstration of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, well, then we should say thank you very much to Richard uh, for the great presentation and for the handling of the questions. Thank you very much. So cheers to your health. Of course, we have different types of drinks. Well, mate from Luis. I guess. All right. Cheers. And thank you all for listening. And now, um,
Just the final reminder that this Tuesday at noon, I hope that many of the speakers, most of the speakers will be able to join because there will be, I believe, an accumulation of questions from the audience. Uh, we'll see how many people will join because last discussion, we joined all by Zoom. So without separating uh, the audience, but it depends, of course, on the number of people we have because policing a couple of hundred of participants is beyond my, I don't know, beyond my plans. So, uh, cheers to everybody one more time, and I hope to see you on Tuesday. All right. Thank bye you. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Nice to see everybody. Bye bye. Be well. Nice to see everybody. Bye bye. Take bye care. Bye. Okay. Just like Mark has said, next Tuesday, we have the, our last session of the Virtual Motor Control Summit School. And this is gonna be an open-ended question session, means that all the speakers, they will, will not answer just like yes or no. They will try to give a long answer. They try to explain, to give you more arguments in order to respond your inquires. So please send questions to us to this email, VMCSS2020, the Virtual Motor Control Summit School 2020, gmail.com. And we are going to get all the questions together. I'm going to send them in order to, to make a very funny end for our Virtual Motor Control Summit School. As Mark has said, probably, we are going to open the session in Zoom. So all of you who wanted to participate, uh, you receive, send me an email, or you're going to receive a how to log in into the Zoom session next Tuesday. So next Tuesday, noon EST, for the Brazilians is the same hour, 13. For the Europeans, will be by the end of the day. And hope to see you all. Stay safe. See you next week. Thank you.